Hi, welcome to the COVID-19 Lake Norman and North Mecklenburg briefing call. Today is Wednesday, June 17th. My name is John Bradford and I have been your briefing call moderator. This is our 13th week. We have now pivoted to Wednesdays only. Uh, I'm a small business owner here in North Mecklenburg. I have two companies, about 20 employees each company. In fact, we're adding two new employees, so we're actually growing. Um, and uh, I used to serve in the North Carolina House of Representatives, and it's been my honor and privilege to bring these calls to you. The purpose has just really been to bring together healthcare experts, you know, government officials, and other business leaders to help provide COVID-19 briefings to update, educate, and support the North Mech region during the outbreak. Uh, we are going to do these calls every Wednesday through phase two, and when we get to phase three, we will go ahead and stop these calls. Uh, just in terms of the cases across the U.S., a little over 2.1 million cases, 116,000 deaths. Uh, last Wednesday, we were at 1.95 million cases, and we had about 110,000, almost 111,000 deaths. Uh, so there's been an increase in about 5,000 deaths across the U.S. in one week. Uh, what's interesting on the heat map on your screen is uh, North Carolina has now changed to the same color as some of the other states that have typically been a darker color. So we are now in the higher, uh, uh, I guess, heat map rating in terms of 40,000 or more cases, uh, which does show that there are a higher number of positive cases here in North Carolina than previously uh, reported. Um, in terms of data from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, we have 1,154 deaths. Uh, last week, a week ago, we were at 1,029 deaths, so there has been an increase, obviously. Uh, there were 774 hospitalizations a week ago, and we're now at 829 hospitalizations. And the total number of confirmed positive cases is 45,800, and we were about 37,000 last week. So it is clear that the number of positive cases uh, are increasing here in North Carolina. Uh, the North Carolina uh, Department of Health and Human Services, our secretary, Mandy Cohen, is putting focus on nine counties right now. A majority of them are urban areas where there's high densities of population, Mecklenburg, Wake, Forsyth, Durham, Guilford. Uh, but there's also a few rural areas like Johnston and Alamance, Duplin and Lee. Uh, so just know that uh, they are putting additional uh, resources into areas with high populations that have been hardest hit by COVID-19. Uh, we are still in phase two. This is the fourth week of phase two. Uh, there is uh, supposed to be a decision rendered next week about phase three. The governor, uh, it is being reported that early next week he will uh, announce something about phase three. Uh, of course, phase two has allowed us to open up 50% capacity at restaurants, personal care, grooming like salons and things like that, tattoo businesses, indoor outdoor pools, and then gathering limits. Uh, were increased to 25 outdoors and that was at 10. Uh, so, you know, those have been some of the changes in phase two. Uh, there was a bill that passed the legislature, the North Carolina House and the Senate, it was actually a bipartisan bill, House Bill 594. This bill would actually also open up uh, outdoor exercise facilities, fitness clubs, yoga studios, dance studios, um, uh, bars and gyms. It passed the Senate uh, and it also passed the House uh, and there was bipartisan support. It is noteworthy that our two elected officials from this area both voted no against uh, this particular bill. Uh, Governor Cooper has not yet signed the bill into law. He has 10 days to take action. Uh, the intent of the bill is to help small business owners who have not been able to reopen to try to bring some parity to let them reopen under certain circumstances to create and continue to promote safety. Uh, so there are some precautions in the bill. Uh, but it would allow some of these small businesses, I think of uh, dance studios and, and yoga studios, uh, they just haven't been able to open to get back to business and their livelihoods, frankly. Uh, and again, bipartisan support in the North Carolina House and Senate. Uh, Gov Governor Cooper did veto a similar bill, House Bill 536, but he said he vetoed it because that bill did not give him control to reclose businesses if something happened, uh, if he felt he needed to do that. So House Bill 594 did add that provision to give him some control, along with a majority support from his Council of State. So if Governor Cooper and a majority of his Council of State wanted to reclose businesses, this bill would allow him to do it. So it seems to address uh, his main concern there. Uh, it is noteworthy that every state around us has reopened to some extent these types of businesses. And the reason why is I think we all agree this virus does not know the difference between uh, someone cutting your hair or a person giving you yoga lessons one-on-one. -on -one. 
And so other states around us have opened, and so our small businesses are continuing to suffer. Uh, the Coalition of North Carolina Fitness Club Operators did put out a statement. Uh, we commend lawmakers in the North Carolina Senate for the passage of this legislation to safely and responsibly reopen fitness centers for North Carolina's 2.5 million health club members and with strong bipartisan support. As an industry, we are committed to the highest health and sanitation standards to provide our members the confidence needed to safely return to their workout routines. We thank Governor Roy Cooper for working with us to this point, and we encourage him to sign this solution-oriented legislation for the physical and mental well-being of our communities. So the real question here, folks, is, is Governor going to veto this bill, especially now that that safety uh, precaution has been added? A uh, phase three, uh, again, that is forthcoming news next week. Uh, it will, if, we'll see, I don't wanna talk too much about phase three, I guess, until we see what the governor has to say next week. Um, let's see, remember the three W's, wear a face covering, wait six feet apart, and please wash your hands. These things are smart, uh, period. I think that's what everyone should be doing, and um, obviously uh, that's something I think you should do. Face shields, if you want a face shield, there's a North Carolina company in Kinston. You can order these for eight bucks a piece. So it's a local company here in North Carolina, $8 shield. It's a frame and a clear mat, uh, uh, like uh, face shield, $8. I hope you order them. And if you want more uh, cloth coverings for your face, we have another North Carolina-based company, Indira Mills, $2 a piece, and uh, you can order those as well. So last slide before we get to our guest, Mecklenburg County, there are 7,336 positive cases with 134 deaths. A week ago, we had 115 deaths, so that does show that we you know, do have a, a, a rising death count, but it seems to be cons uh, consistent. The number of cases, though, have increased at a higher rate than usual. Um, and it is important, though. I don't want to lose sight of this, folks. Almost 100, of the 128 deaths, this was on the 14th of June, all of those except for 11 were greater than 60 years old. Only 11 were this 40 to 59 age. And then all the deaths except two were adults who had underlying chronic illness. And nearly two out of three deaths was attributed to outbreaks at long-term care facilities. And this is up from it was reported 50%. So the reality is, if you're vulnerable, if you're older, you need to take precautions. And no law is going to tell you what to do. You should probably be smart and stay home and practice those three Ws. Uh, you know, you can't legislate common sense. So if you fall in these groups, I would take extra, extra caution here because you are vulnerable. Uh, so let's move to our guest. Uh, we have U.S. Congressman Greg Murphy, who's a Davidson College alum. Uh, he is, represents uh, the North Carolina 3rd District. He's the only, I think, practicing position actually in Congress, uh, and uh, I think he's with us today. Congressman Murphy, happy to have you today, and I uh, would love to hear what's going on both uh, in Congress and just your medical opinion of some things. Well, uh, John, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, thanks again for doing this. This is very informative from the community. It's good to get a, um, an objective viewpoint from a lot of this stuff, because unfortunately, sometimes we don't get that um, from, our, from our media. And so nationally, um, there is discussion about what the next package is going to look like. Um, we've tried to readjust some of the payments uh, to hospitals that care for underserved individuals because they're actually the worst ones hit with all this. So that's a lot more work. I've been working uh, pretty, pretty heavily on that. Let me just uh, speak a little bit about the state, about the Southeast. You know, the, the great, uh, one of the great clamorings when we started out with the uh, pandemic was testing, testing. We need more testing. And um, we're seeing that. That's where we are right now. You know, the American industry truly stepped up. CDC first came out with a, a test, and it was, to be very honest with you, um, uh, poor at best. And so we really have very good testing at this point. It's not perfect. It is not perfect, but it is so much better than what we had before. And as we know with medicine, anytime that you test for something, anytime you look for it, you're going to find it. You're going to find it more often. And that's really what we're, what we're doing. That's why the numbers have in positivity have increased so much. I was speaking with one of our surgeons this morning at our um, local medical center. Every patient who comes into the, through the doors uh, for surgery gets tested. And now we're picking up a fair number of people who are asymptomatic, don't even know that they have it. And we do find that those individuals, and I have to say I disagree with the WHO on this, um, they said it's very, very rare for an asymptomatic person to transmit. It, Dr. Burks and I in, in D.C. Uh, both uh, disagree with this statement. Those people transmit or else we wouldn't have transmission of this. Probably not nearly as high as if someone was symptomatic, but it does transmit. And so what we've been seeing in North Carolina is an increase in cases. And the, the two main factors that we look at, we look at hospitalizations and we look at deaths. 
And uh, if everybody remembers talking about flattening the curve, flattening the curve, the flattening the curve uh, was not going to change the fact that the viruses are going to, going to be present. It was to try to get our hospitals time for resources, which they now have. And in the vast majority of cases, it's pretty rare for hospitals to not have what they need. No person in this nation has been not denied a ventilator what they, when they need it. And so what, for, what we're seeing is we are seeing some uptick in hospitalizations. But fortunately, these are people, um, as demonstrated by the precipitous decline in death rates, who are minimally or mildly symptomatic. We know that only one person out of 20 who develops this infection actually requires hospitalization. So we're in a much better place. Um, I really do believe that we have the data available to move forward in the state rather than move backward. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We have an educated public, we have an educated business community, how to do things safely. Um, I think it's a false narrative to, say, to think that this virus is gonna go away. To be very blunt and honest, I think we're gonna be dealing with this for about two years. Hopefully we're gonna have a vaccine. I think the, uh, won't talk too long here. Um, the, the U.S. government now has narrowed this down to about seven uh, vaccines for trials, large-scale trials that are starting, and the hope is that we'll have this uh, by the end of the year. So a lot of information there, John. Um, I think we're not in a perfect place, and I don't think we're going to be in a perfect place for quite some time, but we're in a much better place than we were several months ago, and in my opinion, there's no reason to, um, to start going settle, pedaling backwards because it's not going to change um, how we live, and I think we need again to have the mantra of living with this virus rather than keep running from it. So thank you for your time. Hope that was helpful. No, very, very helpful, Congressman, and thanks for all you do for our state, and uh, we just appreciate you being in D.C., so thanks again. Uh, moving to every uh, every Wednesday, uh, since we started these calls, uh, we've uh, been uh, lucky to have uh, the United States Small Business Administration, the director of North Carolina, Mr. Thomas A. Stith III, and he joins us again today. Director Stith, we'd love to hear an update from you about what's going on with the USSBA. Uh, John, thank you, and uh, glad to join you again today. I uh, just want to give a update on uh, two initiatives, the Paycheck Protection Program, as we've talked to uh, over the last several weeks. Uh, we are seeing, uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, a, a, a June 30th date that all applications will have to be approved by June 30th. Uh, there is still significant funding remaining. We're encouraging all small businesses to um, that have not um, pursued a Paycheck Protection Program loan to, uh, to again uh, see if it may be best for your business model to do so. Uh, the Paycheck Protection uh, Program Flexibility Act passed on the 5th and I believe we talked some last week uh, uh, really was as a re result of listening to the small business and nonprofit community. So there's additional uh, flexibility uh, with the uh, PPP uh, loan initiative. Uh, the cover period is now 24 weeks versus eight. Uh, so there's a 24 week period to expend funds if uh, forgiveness is uh, uh, interest to the small business. The proportion amount of spend for payroll is now 60%. Uh, to qualify for full forgiveness as opposed to 20, uh, 75%, 40% now may be spent on uh, utilities, rent, and lease payments uh, 20, uh, when it was originally 25. Uh, and also, the, the all loans after June 5th are now, uh, any portion not forgiven, are, are now uh, a five-year term at 1% interest. Loans prior to June the 5th, uh, can be extended to five years, that uh, amount that may not be forgiven, uh, that, but that would have to be negotiated between the bank and the borrower. Um, again, North Carolina has be benefited significantly over $12 billion of financial assistance to our small business community here in the state. Uh, so we encourage uh, uh, small businesses that have not participated to, to take advantage of the uh, availability of funding now. Uh, on the economic injury disaster loan, uh, if you, you may recall that that portal had been uh, closed recently other than for agriculture-based businesses, that portal is now reopened uh, for all small businesses and nonprofit and in addition to agriculture businesses. So um, again, you know, there was this significant response to the EIDL initiative, uh, and which resulted in also limited funding and, and a need for the portal to be closed for a period of time. Uh, but now that that is reopened, uh, if individuals, and that is a direct relationship with SBA, 
uh, that uh, portal uh, and application process can be accessed at sba.gov forward slash disaster, sba.gov forward slash disaster. Currently over $620 million worth of idle loans have been approved in North Carolina. And so if, if there are business, small businesses or nonprofits that are, are interested in pursuing the economic injury disaster loan with that accompanying up to $10,000 advance, uh, that portal uh, and, and the advance is based on number of employees. You qualify it's $1,000 per employee. That portal is now reopened. And so uh, encourage businesses that may have an interest in that uh, to pursue uh, application to the idle process. So John, again, thank you for the opportunity and uh, we will continue to provide new information as, as it is made available. Very good. Hey, uh, Director Stith, how much money do you know is left in the PPP program? I know June 30th is the deadline, but how much is left approximately, do you know? Uh, a pro and I say over a uh, hundred billion dollars uh, right okay. now, and that's nationally, not just dedicated to North Carolina. So that, that figure yeah. is uh, candidly constantly changing. Uh, so we know yeah. well over a hundred billion dollars estimate at this point, last data is, is probably well over $120 billion, but uh, just to be conservative with numbers, we're saying over a hundred billion, but significant amount of funding remaining. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, if 12 billion was allocated to North Carolina for PPP, there's plenty of money for North Carolina business owners. They just need to apply, but they need to get on it by June 30th. So I'll thank you for all these updates. Yeah, I was the, the 12 billion dollar figure is what has uh, been uh, approved for North Carolina businesses. So they actually have that in okay. hand. Uh, there's a broader amount, the, the full remaining hundred billion dollars is still available to uh, small business to apply for. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, very, very good. Well, thank you. And we always enjoy having you on every Wednesday. So thank you, Director Stith. Thank you. So you bet. Moving on to uh, Dr. Jack. He's a local doctor right here on the ground with Atrium Health. Dr. Jack Faircloth, uh, I, hope, I think you're with us today. We'd love to you know, get your perspective what's going on at the field level. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, my pleasure. So <clears throat> I, uh, I hate to disagree with the congressman uh, who's I, I believe was speaking mostly to a national uh, perspective on COVID-19, but we're still uh, seeing uh, slight uh, increases and in signs of um, maybe not a second wave, but uh, at least a prolonged first wave, if, if anything. So I'll, I'll get to the details. Um, there are some positive news, though, um, and I'll start with that. Um, for the first time, a ever a medicine has shown to decrease um, mortality with COVID-19. So I want to um, share the name of that medicine. It's called dexamethasone, and it's commonly prescribed as uh, under the brand name Medrol Dose Pack. It's available everywhere, and it's been shown in a major trial uh, to be the first drug to actually save lives from COVID-19. Uh, the catch to it, though, is that it it only saved lives that were given to those sick enough um, to need it. So it was the patients who, who um, had lives saved were either on oxygen or on a ventilator. So you had to give it to eight patients on a ventilator to see one patient's um, lives saved and 25 patients on oxygen to see one life saved and no benefit if you weren't um, requiring oxygen. So it's a big breakthrough because this drug is $4 at every pharmacy without insurance, well, most pharmacies without insurance. Uh, it's very cheap, it's readily available, it's a, it's a mild steroid. Um, so that's a, real, that's a real positive breakthrough from the treatment front. Um, I would also uh, say a positive uh, breakthrough is that we, we have a, a firmer handle on how COVID-19 is um, spread. Um, we weren't sure the importance of respiratory droplets versus contact spread from surfaces um, until we sort of went at both, both angles. Um, and we still need to have, um, you know, decreased uh, touching of our face and increased cleaning measures. But it does look like that crowding um, in poor ventilated areas with um, the chance for more respiratory droplets to uh, be transferred from person to person looks like the, the bulk or the, the major factor in spreading. So, being outside, being in the sunlight, being where good air is moving, social distancing, and wearing a mask are looking to be um, 
confirmed by more and more new data that comes out. Uh, because of these uh, studies that continue to confirm the respiratory droplet, I do expect North Carolina and Mecklenburg County leaders to require face masks um, in, uh, for the, when we're in the public soon. Um, the concerning numbers for North Carolina and for Mecklenburg. Testing um, has gone up, um, but so has hospitalization. So here's the perspective. We currently have had four out of the last seven days, we've had an all-time high for hospitalization numbers in North Carolina. So today, our number of patients hospitalized was 849. That compares to 829 on Tuesday, which was a previous high. And over the weekend, 823 was a previous high. To put it in perspective, we didn't reach 600 for hospitalized patients in the state of North Carolina uh, until Memorial Day. So we've had a jump of 200 since then. Um, this is certainly not a crisis point. We have plenty of hospital capacity, not only in Mecklenburg, but in, in the state. We're at 74% of state hospital bed use and ICU bed use. So we have capacity, but our leaders are noticing these numbers and using them to make decisions about reopening. Um, of Mecklenburg County hospital numbers, um, just to, to give a, a more local uh, flavor to that, we averaged over the past seven days, 106 patients hospitalized per day from COVID-19. Um, so from a testing perspective, our, our diagnostic uh, rate of positives for new tests done is up to 11%. It was at 9.7% last week. Uh, the big concern there is the bulk of it continues to be the Hispanic, um, well, I, I said that wrong. Uh, the demographic that is contributes the highest out of all is the Hispanic population. So more than a third, 38% of our numbers in Mecklenburg were from the Hispanic population, especially the young population. Um, the health department, health department is addressing that. So, I mean, in summary, we have a, a medicine now that's readily available, that saves lives if you're sick enough with COVID-19 to require oxygen. Um, nationally, there has been more testing and more numbers uh, from that testing, but we as a state and as a county are seeing a um, higher rate of hospitalizations, a higher rate of new positives. So we need to keep our guard, our guard up and learn to live with this virus. Um, but it will require continued social distancing and probably uh, masks in public, I believe, um, in the short short term. Very good, Dr. Jag. That was a that was a really powerful update, and uh, just it's just a friendly reminder that we need to everyone just needs to try to play their part and uh, wear a mask if you can. I know uh, uh, Commissioner Cotham has made points. Some people have issues and they can't wear a mask because of mental health. And so, and, and those are rare circumstances, but we have to acknowledge those. But if you can, and you are comfortable wearing a face cloth covering, then, you know, just let's all do our part. And uh, so th thanks for uh, sharing. That was a really good update. Appreciate you. And yeah. thanks for all that you do for our area, uh, Dr. Jack. Uh, so speaking of uh, Mecklenburg County uh, Commissioner, she's at, our commissioner at large, uh, Ms. Pat Cotham, uh, are you with us today, Commissioner? Yes, I am. Yay, the, mi the microphone's yours. All right, well, thank you. And again, I always appreciate listening to the other speakers and I always come away from these calls um, more knowledgeable. So thanks again, John, for your leadership in doing this. Um, uh, we're talking, uh, we had a board meeting last night and it went till 11 o'clock. And um, we talked a lot about a lot of different things, but we did talk about COVID and we did talk about um, the cost of COVID and we went into, we heard great details about that and what the plans were and we have to spend money. And um, uh, they, we did learn that uh, the Northern towns had made requests and there was, there was no pushback on this. Um, and that was Huntersville had asked for $405,000, Davidson $270,000, uh, Cornelia $72,000, and the Ada Jenkins Center $750,000. So those were the numbers from um, that I saw last night from North Mecklenburg. And we'll, you know, we we just received this information, so it was more 
they were just giving us information on that. But um, I, certainly the money that we're getting from the federal government is uh, helping and making a difference. And uh, we're doing a good job of, uh, you know, trying to spread it out and trying to be transparent on it. And um, so I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, let's talk about masks because we talked about it and I have gotten um, a lot of feedback from um, our residents here in Mecklenburg County um, for and against. Um, you know, a lot of people are just, you know, everybody needs to wear a mask. You have to do this and, um, you know, kind of demanding it. Um, uh, my colleagues, I, I don't like it when, you know, we, we were pushed to vote on something with not much thought or not much time for discussion. So, but that's what happened last night. And um, I think it was Trevor Fuller made a, a motion that, that uh, we, uh, that, that at our next meeting that we all vote on, um, you know, demanding or mandating that people wear masks. And now we have been told over and over and over again, let me throw one more over again in that, that the county cannot do that without the support of the six towns and that, that we cannot do that. And I, um, but they were all in support of doing this and it was my time to vote. I, and I knew the answer, but I said, you know, Madam Manager, Dina, Man Dina Diorio was there. You have told us repeatedly that we are we cannot do this because we need to have the support of the six towns. Um, and she said, yes, that's correct. We cannot do that. And so I voted no. And I was the only one who voted no. And, um, you know, I was just, you know, this is what happens when there's elections going on. And... <laughs> And I don't like it that this thing, this COVID has become uh, partisan. And, um, but anyway, uh, that's what happened last night. Now, after that, I received a, a lot of emails um, from people who, you know, were not happy about this, this vote. And I also heard uh, from some air filtration engineers. Uh, uh, this let's see this year i have i was invited to go to some air filtration engineers conferences so i thought well this is this is way before covid and i went because i thought well i could probably learn something here and um and i did learn and um and they certainly remember that i was there and i have been hearing from them and they are giving me uh a total different perspective on mask and um, John I might send you uh, uh, some of this information so if anyone asks you about it but um, they were just uh, again they are experts in air filtration and they were just saying that these masks unless it's at N95 certified to 0.3 um, you know, are really not helpful, uh, hardly helpful. And, um, and they, they just wanted, um, you know, more information than with the attitude of, you know, let us make our own decisions, but we would like to have more information. And they wanted more focus on the people who were suffering the most, people who were over 70 people in long-term long care facilities or, or nursing homes and they wanted that but it was kind of uh, interesting to read their you know emails and how they analyzed um the same data i mean it's, i think it's good to have different perspectives from different different people and and um one of them mentioned um uh you know that that japan has used a a, a lot of mask um but he also said they have fewer people with chronic problems um, and obesity is only, you know, like 4%, whereas in the United States, it's 36%. And uh, obesity brings diabetes and high blood pressure. So, you know, all of these things are very complicated. And um, we continue to learn. But I, I wasn't going to um, 
you know, I'm more of a, to me, it wasn't, it didn't make sense to support that last night because I know we can't do that. And um, I do believe that there are a lot of reasons why people, you know, do not want to wear a mask. Um, sometimes the their person who is with them, a loved one, maybe an older person, has a has a hearing problem and they can't hear if the other person is wearing a mask. And I, I continue to hear all these stories. And so, you know, I'm, I think that uh, what I'm most concerned about in our community is we're getting people that are shaming other people. And that is not helpful. Everyone is stressed because of the situation we're in. Parents are stressed, worried about their kids, you know, worried about what's going to happen with the schools. Uh, people are losing their companies and then people are getting shamed. And um, so I, I am, I am concerned about this and I, I do think, I do wish that um, we could have, you know, more information from a lot of different people and, and put it out there and then let people decide for themselves as opposed to, you know, forcing people to do things um, so anyway, so those are the frustrations of this county commissioner, and that concludes my comments. No, very good. Well, we, we appreciate your comments, and that uh, was very thorough, and, and, we, and I understand uh, the spirit of what you're saying. And, um, I mean, we've seen conflicting reports about masks, even from the, you know, the World Health Organization and the CDC. So, uh, you know, I, I choose to wear one when I go out. That's a personal choice. And, um, you know, so, you know, again, um, I guess we'll see how things shake out. But thanks for your, thanks for your leadership, Pat. Uh, moving Thank to you, the Pat. town, you're very welcome. Moving to the town of Cornelius, uh, Mayor Woody Washam. Uh, Mayor, the microphone's yours. Thank you so much, John. And uh, I want to follow up just a little bit with uh, uh, Commissioner Cotham's comments on masks, because we had a pretty in-depth uh, discussion at my town board on Monday about that, because I, I knew this was coming down the coming down the trail for us to think about. And actually, our board unanimously. Uh, uh, instructed me I don't have to have their permission but I wanted their input I like to represent not only my citizens but certainly my board as well uh, they feel like uh, the required mass should not uh, should not take place uh, and uh, they have backed me to to not sign a resolution to to actually uh, move that forward and the main reason from their standpoint is that you just can't enforce it. It's just no way to enforce it. We do want to uh, encourage, highly, highly encourage folks to wear the mask, but to require it doesn't seem like uh, that makes much sense. Now, if it comes down from the state level, uh, certainly we will have to adhere to that because the county is aligned with the state uh, uh, orders and so forth. So uh, that's where me and my board stand on the mask. Uh, I want to point out that I'm really proud of the folks in Peninsula, Peninsula Club in particular. As many of you have read, uh, there was a situation out there where they had to close the club uh, down uh, this past uh, uh, weekend. And uh, all, all I want to say about that or all I want to add to that discussion is they had a great protocol in place which they followed to the T. It was the right thing to do. It was some tough decisions to shut the club down. They've gone through a massive uh, sanitation and cleaning of the entire club at a uh, very high level of expense to the membership. Um, they do plan to open tomorrow if all checks out. Uh, so I'm very proud of, uh, of the communications that they've had with me, our town staff, and, um, and their residents out there. So uh, they raised the awareness of the COVID situation to great heights. Um, they did have some exposure. They did have some infectious folks that were uh, out amongst the, the uh, some of the amenities out there, the, the golf and the tennis and the uh, swimming areas. And uh, But they reacted in, in a fantastic way. And I certainly encourage other organizations and clubs to follow that lead. Now, I do want to tell everybody about, uh, you know, we're making our way through this uh, pandemic the best we can. Uh, and our Parks and Rec folks, so they have started their summer camps uh, in a very orchestrated, careful, cautious, and uh, uh, a, a way that they can comply with the regulations, and that's going well so far. Uh, we've also 
scheduled a patriotic celebration. As many of you know, we have the symphony out at uh, Bailey Road Park about this time every year. It's a wonderful event with fireworks and great patriotic music. So we're not going to be stopped by this pandemic. We're going to have a virtual celebration, and it's going to be on the 26th. It's going to be based at D9 Brewery again, and uh, you'll be able to ride by and pick up uh, some uh, famous uh, meals from some of our some of our area food trucks. But in addition to that, you can take that home, uh, have your dinner, and uh, enjoy the, the patriotic music of uh, Rocky Lynn, who's a, certainly a favorite in, in our uh, in our community. And uh, that's going to be on the Cornelius Parks and Rec Facebook page. So look forward to that. And uh, we will have a meeting um, tomorrow at 7 o'clock where we will consider the ratification of our annual budget. Uh, and that uh, is planned for seven o'clock, and it will be on uh, on Zoom. It'll be a virtual meeting, be on Zoom. And in addition to that, the uh, uh, main reason for bringing that up is we'll be honoring what I consider is uh, one of the finest citizens of uh, North Mecklenburg and the Lake Norman community, and that is Georgia Kruger upon her retirement from Ada Jenkins. Uh, we will miss her dearly. Uh, we all love her to death. She's done such a good job and she means so much to our community. So we'll be honoring her with a mayoral um, proclamation uh, tomorrow at that particular meeting. And that's all I have, John. Thanks. No, yeah, thank you, Mayor. That was a, that was a, good, a good update. And, uh, and you're right, Georgia Kruger is a very fine individual. So uh, moving to the uh, town of Huntersville, Mayor John Anarella. Mayor, the microphone is yours. Hey, John. And uh, we also on Monday acknowledged uh, the life and times and the wonderful things that uh, Georgia Kruger has done for our community. And I know her uh, fairly well, and I know she'll still be engaged in some way, shape, or form. So we look forward to seeing what she does in her uh, next stage. Um, well, a couple of things. One, some good news uh, from our park and rec. We are going to be hosting baseball and softball tournaments starting June 26th, so that's next weekend. And I know there are probably a lot of parents and, and children that are really ready to get out there and compete, so that's great. Our summer camps also opened up at the Huntersville Rec Center as well as our uh, Huntersville Family Fitness and Aquatic Center. And I was over there yesterday and everybody looks like they're having a good time. The little kids have their masks on and so forth and, and trying to keep away from each other, but uh, I'm sure they're doing as, as good a job as they can. Um, you know, in terms of this whole issue with, with the masks and, and so forth, I think I, I am leaning towards the same as uh, the uh, Cornelius uh, board, although I have not discussed it with my board. Uh, you know, I, I've worn a, a mask uh, at various times, but not all the time. It just it just depends. I've gone to grocery stores, I wear a mask because there's a lot of food around there. And if there's something that I would uh, put on somebody else's food, it, it would totally be inappropriate. But, you know, I've gone out to eat at restaurants and didn't wear a mask at that time. Uh, so I think, you know, enforcement, yes, is, would be really hard. Uh, there are loopholes with, with all the uh, potential uh, wearing mask laws or rules, um, and how would you know if somebody wasn't uh, within that loophole? So um, I will agree with my good friends to the north and, and Cornelius at this time. I encourage you to wear them if you feel comfortable uh, in certain circumstances not wearing them. Uh, you know, please be respectful of uh, those around you. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, the talk of the spiking or the increased cases, I really am amazed that people are surprised by this. And this is something that going back two or three months ago, uh, we talked about, look, we can't overwhelm our uh, hospital system. So we want to shut down the economy and then we'll reopen. And at that time, We'll have more testing, a better sense of how we can help people if they do get this. And then you know, we anticipate uh, that there'll be a spike later on. And if you recall, they used to tell us that the spike was April 15th and then it was gonna be June and now it's July and August. 
And I think, uh, as Congressman said, uh, Greg Murphy, if you start looking at the hospitalizations, one of our highest days was back in early April, and we have just uh, passed that over the last few days. So I, I think we've done what we anticipated doing or hope to do back in uh, March and April. And I, th I think, as I said last week, it's just going to come down to there were going to be a certain amount of people that were going to get sick. And there are a certain amount of people in high risk areas that had a greater um, chance of uh, having something significant happen to them. So it just looks like to me, if you look around the country, it, it doesn't it's not going to matter at the end of the day how uh, a particular state went into it and came out of it. It's just going to be that, you know, X amount of people are going to catch this. And I actually went uh, today to get an antibody test. I'm part of a, a study through uh, Wake Forest and Atrium. And, uh, you know, we'll see if uh, I've been exposed to this at, at any point. So that's all I have, John. And I uh, look forward to uh, what the governor has to say next week. I'm not overly optimistic at this time, but uh, hopefully things will get better between now and next week. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mayor Anarell. I appreciate you. Uh, moving to the town of Davidson, Commission, uh, Town Commissioner Matthew Ford, I believe, is with us today. Commissioner? John, thanks for having me on. And um, I, I think that uh, to echo what Mayor Anarella and Mayor Washam mentioned about the enforcement policy of requiring masks on a, on a local level, we had a meeting and we discussed it. And we opted to, to ask, please, and thank you, and ask nicely versus requiring it because from an enforcement issue, uh, standpoint, it's just something that's going to be very difficult to to enforce, especially it's just one town out of many towns within the entire state of North Carolina, adding confusion across borders uh, where you have hair salons, you know, and a mile down the road, you have another hair salon and, and different rules. So I think we opted the way that we did, not because we uh, don't believe in the notion of wearing a mask to help uh, prevent the spread of the disease, but just from a, from a realistic standpoint, you've got to you got to know what you can do and what you can't do and what's going to be effective. Um, so to that end, what, I, what I've encouraged our board to do, and we're going to have a, a special meeting on it on July 1st, I believe, is to, is to write a letter to, to Governor Cooper that we all sign asking him to require masks statewide, because I think that the only way that it would be, it, we would be able to accomplish this is to do it at a statewide level. Because I think even in Mecklenburg County, as we saw when Mecklenburg County had uh, their own rules and regulations that created confusion out there within the state of North Carolina. So uh, I would I would say to to our Mecklenburg County commissioners, to our, our neighbors, to the north, south, east, and west of us, I expect a copy of that letter to to hit your inboxes as well, asking you to uh, ask the same if if you so choose, and, and try and if we're going to do this, we should probably do it from the top down as, at a statewide level versus at a local municipality level. So. Um, we we do have our signage out. We have the all all we ask is wear a mask and the six feet required and the the wash hand signs everywhere. I think it's helping. I was pleased to participate in the peaceful protest a couple Saturdays ago and proud to report that I'd say 99.9% .9 of the people there were actually wearing masks. Uh, and also just to, uh, to make sure that everybody understands. So if you are a part of those protests, the Mecklenburg County Board of Health recommends that you do go get tested for COVID-19 uh, because you did put yourself in a higher risk situation. And I can tell you that I have had that test done and that test has come back negative. Uh, the test is not necessarily pleasant, but it's also uh, something that, that is not so unpleasant that, that you, you shouldn't go do it. So um, you've got one more data point as far as tested, uh, but not positive right here, uh, live and in person. So that's all I have, John. No, that's very good. Yeah, thanks for the update, uh, uh, Commissioner Fort, and appreciate you uh, joining us. And like I said, every Wednesday we do these, so if you can hop on, we'd love to have you. Uh, let's see, moving to, uh, there's no updates from uh, CMS Board, uh, District 1 Board Member Rhonda Cheek uh, from last week. Um, there's a lot of graduations going on, so nothing to share. And then now we're going to the Chief Executive Officer of the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Bill Russell. Uh, Mr. Russell, the microphone's yours, sir. Thank you, John. Uh, John, you know, three weeks ago, it looked like the sun was peeking out from behind the clouds and businesses were starting to reopen and there was some sense of, okay, we're going to get back to normalcy. And then we had the issue of race relations, which gripped this country. Um, and it's, it's been profound. 
tomorrow we're having a program that we're going to be um, taping and then getting out to our membership and to businesses at large. And it's going to be a diversity program on change for a challenged community. Um, and, you know, the thing, I, I, when I look at this, we just like Matt was just saying, we've had these peaceful protests here in Cornelius and Davis and Huntersville. And to a large extent, I think the reason we don't see uh, the violence sometimes erupt that the other communities around the country has is because of the great work that organizations like the Ada Jenkins Center that, that Woody was mentioning a while ago, uh, the unity and community, our, our strong faith-based churches who have done a tremendous job, and our law enforcement. When you look at the police departments of Cornelius and Davidson and Huntersville, if you ever attend a national night out and see the interaction between the officers and, and the public, um, it, they are community-based. And, and I think that that's why we've been able to avoid some of the issues in other communities. But we have some of those folks that are going to be represented on a panel tomorrow. Uh, Teddy McDaniel, who's the president of the Urban League, is going to be with us, along with Reverend Paula Ennis. She's a nationally known author and speaker, primarily in the Christian community. Vince Hoyle, who is a police chief for the town of Huntersville. And of course, uh, Vince was a police chief here in Cornelius as well. Adrian Bones, who is uh, Bones Wallace, who represents the Unity and Community Group that I just spoke about. And Harold Rice, uh, he's the incoming executive director of the Yeda Jenkins Center, who will be replacing Georgia once her retirement um, becomes official. And we, we welcome Harold and appreciate him being willing to uh, be on this panel. It's going to be emceed by Dan Houston, uh, who is the chair of our diversity um, panel. And, and again, we're going to ask a series of hard questions because race is one of those questions, uh, one of those issues that is just very difficult for many people to talk about. So again, we're going to to tape that uh, and, and get that out and disseminate it out into our social media and to the public. And I think it's a be, be a good discussion, good dialogue. On Friday, we have Eric Boyette, who has been appointed the secretary of the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, we're going to have that program also uh, taped and, and get that out and disseminated. And, and Eric is going to be talking about uh, some of the challenges that DOT is facing. Uh, again, as we both know, and John, you particularly having been our representative, uh, all the unfunded road projects that we have, and now on top of that, maybe some mismanagement um, by NCDOT, and and certainly um, we've, we've got a lot more roads that need to improve them than we have um, money to improve them. So that's going to be an interesting program talking about our infrastructure. So between a, a, a discussion on race relations, uh, diversity and inclusion, a discussion on our transportation infrastructure, uh, busy week. Uh, we still got ahead of us uh, with the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce. Um, most of our businesses started back, but as you already talked about, some of the others have not, uh, particularly those, uh, the gyms, fitness firms, uh, aerobics, martial arts, uh, bars, uh, those still have not been able to start back. And I remind people that on our website, we have a, a comprehensive guide on restarting your business called Restart LKN. You can find that on our website at LakeNormanChamber.org. Uh, in addition, these programs that I just spoke about, they too are on our website, along with a lot of other programs. Um, I mentioned last Wednesday, we had our first ribbon cutting uh, of a new business that, that had opened up. They'd actually been open for, I think they opened in February, but uh, we weren't able, actually able to celebrate until last week. But it was, it was great that we were seeing that. We're starting to see business coming back. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we got a report of, uh, I think it was actually yesterday, retail sales numbers uh, have climbed dramatically and uh, actually overshot um, twice the number of what uh, economists thought. So uh, we're seeing things uh, nationally and think, seeing things here at the lake return and uh, very thankful for that. Uh, John, thank you for uh, this, this call and, and thank you for including us. Yeah, you are very welcome, and you are being a scholar and a gentleman about the DOT. Maybe they overspent. Yeah, they overspent seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Let's just call a spade a spade, folks. Uh, I mean, well, the, uh, well, the, part, the current leader. Yeah. So we try to we try to be nice. Yeah, I understand, but seven hundred fifty million dollars of overspending um, is uh, absurd. I mean, it's going to impact projects here locally. So anyway. Uh, it's another day, another discussion. So uh, thank you for your leadership and for being a part of these calls. 
so thanks again, Bill. Uh, just uh, uh, moving on here, Huntersville Regional Chamber, here's a resource for you if you'd like to check it out. And then visit Lake Norman. I uh, always like to report a little, a little a tidbit on those guys. Uh, they are right here uh, in our backyard, really advocating for our area. And uh, some really cool news, they have the, um, they submit a lot of our events in the area to try to be recognized uh, by national organizations. And so there's the Southeast Tourism Society Top 20 list, which publishes the top 20 events in the whole Southeast tourism sort of bucket. And we had several events, uh, thanks to Lake Norman, that were recognized on that list. The uh, Lock Norman Highland Games, the Asian Festival and Dragon Boat Race, the Carolina Renaissance Festival, and Christmas and Davidson were all selected as that are uh, on that top 20 list. So that's uh, one, two, three, four. So, you know, we're looking at, uh, 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 you know, just uh, a high percentage, right? Uh, almost 20% of those uh, items are right here in Lake Norman, which is awesome. Uh, and then uh, Lake, the Lock Norman Highland Games and Asian Festival and Dragon Boat Race has been rescheduled. Those things usually happen in May and April, but those dates have slipped by us. And so they're rescheduled for October. Uh, no scheduling updates to report right now on the Carolina Renaissance Festival or Christmas in Davidson. Uh, so I don't really have anything to share with you on those. So we just have to stay tuned to see what happens. But uh, kudos to our friends at Lake, Visit Lake Norman. Again, just thanking all of our panelists uh, for making these calls possible. We now record these calls every Wednesday. This is our 13th week. You can follow me on Twitter, John Ray Bradford, or Elect Bradford on Facebook. That's where I post these calls. Our next briefing will be a week from now, Wednesday, June 24th, with hopefully the same uh, lineup and cast of characters, and uh, look forward to having them all back. And if you have an email, send it to lkntogether at gmail.com. I get lots of emails there, surprisingly, uh, and I'm happy about that, and, uh, and we're really helping some folks. So if you have an email, shoot it to us, lkntogether at gmail.com. We are stronger together. I want you to take care of yourself, take care of each other. This does conclude today's briefing call. Thanks for listening.